Um, for young composers, first of all, I'd recommend the solar panel industry. I think that's a great way to make money <laughs> and uh, a lot of security. Also, I think if you got a, um, a medical I degree, might, you will work for I a might, long time. I might take you up on that one. Right. They say that the head of music is part traffic cop and part fireman. Hey, what's going on everyone? Guggen Singh here, hope you guys are all doing well. Last month, I had the great pleasure of speaking with Robert Kraft, who was formerly the president of music at 20th Century Fox. So Robert had an amazing career, an amazing position at 20th Century Fox, where he oversaw the music of some of the most incredible films to date, I would argue. We got an amazing response and I really wanna thank Robert, um, on behalf of all of the guild, um, for you know basically speaking to you know several hundred composers across our country, so that was pretty pretty awesome and pretty wonderful. Robert is really one of my favorite people behind the scenes in the film music industry. He's got such a great sense of humor, which you'll see. He's very grounded and humble, and he never fails to see the forest through the trees. His perspective on life in general is really what what's really inspiring and the takeaway for me personally. So what I really wanted to do here is I wanted to just pick out some of my favorite nuggets of wisdom and condense a few of them and share them with you. If you're an emerging composer, producer, record producer, songwriter, or someone who's really aspiring to move up in the business on an executive level, I think this is great and I think Robert um, shares a lot of life wisdom and not just wisdom of um, this particular industry. I really want to spe especially take the time to thank the Screen Composers Guild of Canada, which is uh, a national association of music composers. Um, and we do a lot of advocacy work and education work across Canada, representing several hundred composers. So with that said, I hope you guys enjoy it. Please let me know what you think. Comment, like, subscribe to the channel as well. And feel free to shoot me a message as well with your thoughts. Hope you guys enjoy it. You know, so I started as a songwriter. I have no business chops, none. Somebody offers me money, I say sure. Somebody offers <laughs> me uh, a contract, I would sign it. I never read it. Right. And I think right. the, the most ironic part of that was that I ended up the head of a division of a global media company in Los Angeles that was so steeped in business and contracts and deals and uh you know i was responsible right. for 24 movies a year and probably 300 episodes of television a year and making all the deals for it but um you know you learn i think i think you you learn in a way to stay near your strengths i did my strength was music i right. was good with music and I would find competent business legal people. And I think if you're around it enough, like a language, you kind of start to feel, I kind of know what they mean when they talk about recoupment strategies or <laughs> revenue sharing. And I'd go, um, you know, you nod sagely. Yeah, sure. We need revenue sharing on this. Right. The back right? end money. <laughs> um, and back ends. Right. And all that. But right. Sometimes I'm in conversations where I speak about this stuff now fairly fluently, and I think something must have changed. I learned it. But I understand what your original question is. is how did you do all those things? And it's just because I was an idiot and said yes to everything. It's, it's that <laughs> simple. Like, Somebody asked, through, can I through it, you know, the, all these, these high, high stress type of positions you've had, how have you been able to maintain this kind of like, underlying grace that you always seem to have about life where it is you you really do have the energy of an artist because I, I, I think you just, I think you just said it I think if if there if if you see that and it exists I think it's two things first of all as an artist you're always just improvising you know you don't panic oh my god it's going to be wrong I don't know you you know, there's something in jazz where you say wrong and strong. You play the wrong note and you say, <laughs> I meant to play that. 
So right, right. there's a little bit of you're just flowing in any situation. But I also I find chaos and disruption and anxiety um, entertaining. So wow. <laughs> um, so and everybody else seems so completely stressed by it. Oh, my God. Um, you know what look it's all going pear-shaped and it's and I think yeah it's funny I mean we're, it, it's so out of we're our screwed. control right so right right I mean I, listen I get as anxious as everybody does about everything but if if you get frenetic it doesn't ever improve you know when the boat's sinking you only can get so many dixie cups full of water out of it at you go as fast as you need to but frenzy just right. creates more more frenzy so i think my my initial reaction is just listen let's just do what we can see what we can figure out and um move move forward from here Right. But at Fox, what was the decision-making process like when hiring a composer? Was it just strictly kind of based on budgets or was it kind of like, let's get a, collect a bunch of demos from, you know, this kind of list of, of people or uh, if you can go into that a little bit. It was um, a combination of both those things, but it also had a little bit of an overriding um an overriding system of course the budget drove everything people don't understand and and they there's a little misnomer of hey man i'll do this for free well when you have a 200 million dollar movie if you were the head of music and hired your neighbor's uncle's girlfriend's roommate <laughs> and because they were free said hey man we right. saved some money well um you know how fast can you clean out your office robert because that's just a horrible judgment call you're only right. going to, first of all, be that you're only in the big leagues. You know, this isn't, this wasn't indie films. And I started at that gig. So it was, I was as, as amazed as anyone when I was told, here's, the, here's who we want. We want either Hans Zimmer or Danny Elfman. And if you can't get them, see if Thomas Newman can do it. And I'd say, you know, this is joyful, but that was who the directors wanted. That's who the studio wanted. So, Right. If you if you look at any major film, and it's obviously evolving, there's a younger crop coming in, but there's a music budget that accommodates the fees of the top talent in the world. This was 20th Century Fox. So yeah. also, I'm rarely hiring composers simply off the strength of a demo. There are a couple misnomers. Number one, I get sent a lot of audio with the description in the email this sounds like it would be cool for a movie and i think i guess but you know i've also done movies right. I, I did like you know napoleon dynamite was done on like a you know children's keyboard and a string bass so you can make movie right. music so right the first right. thing is send me music to picture because the job of the composer is how does he or she write music to picture, to not picture. just cool right. music. I, say, cool. I mean, has has the, the industry as a whole um, done enough in, you know, in terms of initiatives and incorporating women, uh, visible minorities, uh, people of color? Is that really being reflected enough um, in in the film music world, so to speak? I love your your thoughts and impressions there. I think that the answer is a hopeful one. That it's just starting to be. I mean, I think. It's become so present as a topic that um, it can't be ignored anymore. Are we all the way there? Not at all. I bet if you looked at every film released in 2018, you'd still see really disappointing percentages. Um, right. But I think that by 2019, we're starting to see a great development of um, diversity uh, and I, I've always been baffled by it because I come from music which is made by last time I checked correct me if I'm wrong humans and humans right. occur in every flavor and <laughs> you know why can't there be humans simply focused on film music because if you're just in music which I've been my whole life you first of all you close your eyes 
I don't know who's next to me. Can he play the shit out of this track or not? Period. Right. It's like athletics. Are you on it or are you not on it? Um, why in film music did it become sort of limited? And there are a lot of theories, but I think that's starting to break down and we're starting to see so much interesting music. And then it becomes, look at Pinar crushing it on Captain Marvel. Look Strange. at Michael Abel's, that score to us. That's one of my favorite scores so far this year. In recent time, um, right. Yeah. yeah. So Chris Bowers with uh, Green Book, and they're all about to be actual uh, guests on the podcast. Score of the podcast. Oh, amazing. So, um, you know, we copyright also... and performance royalties, which are generated from, you know, streaming services, gaming, you name it. Um, not to say it's good or bad, just to say that, um, you know, again, someone from your point of view, uh, how do they deal? How, how do you uh, navigate these situations and the circumstance that we're, we're now in? I think um, God, every composer, you should put a little warning up right now, which is all composers listening, run away. <laughs> um, it's really hard to make money in music. You can, especially you can, now. <laughs> now, you can trick it out any way you want but there's a top 1% and a bottom 9 million percent. I mean, right. Ariana Grande is making bank. Oh, Good yeah. for her. <laughs> and Billie Eilish is making bank now. Good for her. And you can get on tour. Khalid has a number one record and he's bundled it with tickets and he's making bank. There are also right. incredible amount of talent on SoundCloud and Spotify and out there and doing commercials and doing cool stuff and have their streams and they get their 0. 0.000009 cents on every Spotify stream. And how you make a living doing that, I don't know. How you make a living being alternative and interesting and not being pure pop where there's instant money or pure EDM where you're gonna thump, thump, thump your way into some kind of viral hit. Right. I find it, um, it's always been difficult I think that when I came up in, you know, 611 years ago, it was a, real, <laughs> it was a really clear equation for me. I right. came to New York City. The idea was I would write songs, get signed to a record label. They'd give me some money right. to sign. We'd make a record and we'd put that record, a big shiny vinyl disc in a record store. Hopefully people would buy it. And Why? some of that money would come back to me. And maybe if it got played on the radio, some of that money from the playing would come back to me. Now it's incredibly diffuse, incredibly difficult. You don't know exactly where the point zero 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 nine is coming from. I don't want to be Debbie Downer, but I think it's very hard. And I think the most frustrating thing is there is so much good music out there. I can go forever listening to cool stuff. I think there's just right. Spotify playlists that are people I've never heard of. <laughs> SoundCloud, but, YouTube. Right. right. So right. I don't know how the, they generate income, but I think it's a I think it's a hard part unless you're a top composer, a top songwriter, a top recording artist. There's a whole lot of people that are making wonderful music that should be paid and aren't getting paid what they should be. Right, right. Solar panels. <laughs> Robert can't fix all our problems, guys. Right. <laughs> how that meeting came uh, to be about with Robert. Kenny Edmonds and, and of course, Quincy and, and such. Oh, yeah. Um, I had two really wonderful experiences with Kenny Edmonds, and I thank Quincy for this. Um, I arrived at Fox in October of 1994. I knew if you can look at a scale of from zero to 100 of knowledge about film music, record deals, soundtracks, I was right around zero. Um, <laughs> I had made actually, I'd rec as a musician, I'd produced the Little Mermaid sold millions of soundtracks and I'd right. scored and produced zero. <laughs> Mambo King. So I was about two. But in terms of like <laughs> sitting and making a record deal and right. assembling a score and a soundtrack for a big movie, my 
you know, by myself in charge of it. I was good with doing the music part. I could do that all day long. But like putting together the big package, I had to learn fast. And the very, very first meeting I had was on a movie called Waiting to Exhale. My first meeting at Fox with uh, the director, Forrest Whitaker. And Forrest wanted Quincy Jones to put the record together. So I actually knew Quincy. I'd produced a couple records for Quincy's label prior to coming to Fox. So um, I called Quincy, which was always fun. I didn't get him. Um, And then he called me back. And I remember telling my mother that night, hey, you know, I'm at Fox. I've been at Fox like 48 hours. And guess what? Quincy, Quincy Jones called me this afternoon. And she said, Quincy Jones didn't call you this afternoon he called the chair you sit in which was very humbling from a mom wow. but she was right she said he's calling the head of music at fox and he might know you and all that but he's not just calling you to go hey man there's money there there's a project anyhow quincy thought that for waiting to exhale i shouldn't hire him and i was amazed I said, hey, Q, can you do this movie with Forrest Whitaker? And they want a big soundtrack with all divas. He said, "Mm." he actually said, you can't afford me. And then he said, here's who I want you to meet, a guy named Babyface. I said, well, Babyface, you know, he's an amazing songwriter. He should be in charge of this whole record. So Quincy, Babyface, myself, and Forrest Whitaker went to breakfast. And Babyface wrote... In number one record, he wrote Shoop Shoop for Whitney Houston, which is a number one hit. It was a fantastic wow. project. And the joy of it was that I got to be next to Babyface writing an entire album. And it was just songwriting 101 for me. Alexander oh. Desplat or right. A.R. Rahman from Mumbai and now right. Chennai or Fed- Frederick, Frederick Yusid from Madrid. They've made a name for themselves in their own community and then come to Hollywood, maybe on a a European film, but suddenly they're embraced and that's happening. And I think that that is a wonderful way for someone. And listen, one of my favorite composers is Michael Dana, who is right. Same. Just love him. And I incredible. Yeah. a couple of, great movies with him. I worked with him on Life of Pi, which he won the Academy Award. We did Ice right. Storm. Um, Fellow Torontonian, right? <laughs> he's a tar- Torontonian and um, <laughs> he's part of a music scene in Toronto that I, I'm aware of. And yeah. uh, So I think it's not unheard of and I think that Michael might commute between the two, but he definitely has representation here. And yeah, a he's here. mostly in LA these days. Yeah. yeah. So, um, right. listen, it'd be a little bit like, hey, I want to be in the lobster fishing business, and I know that most of it takes place off the east coast of the United States, but I actually am going to live in Acapulco. Well, right. okay, I guess. I mean, but wouldn't you want to live sort of in Maine? Closer or- to or right. Martha's Vineyard or something. That's where the, so the, the film music business is primarily in Los Angeles. And oh, this is, this is great. And then the next thing comes along and I don't fully know or understand that, but oh, this is great too. And this is, everything was leading me to, to doing this, you know, and what was your, what was the most interesting or the best part of your journey thus far in terms of, in terms of that, trajectory you had because of course they're not all ups there's I'm sure there's been downs and there's been some home runs and there's been some misses and um, oh it's such a nice question and and you just said something which I really relate to which is that feeling of all of it was leading to this right and I've had that a few times where I realized I couldn't be doing this if I hadn't learned this. Learn, I think I learned everything from being in a band and then everything sort of becomes a bigger version of that. Being the head of Fox Music was just being the head of the band. It was 54 wow. people. It was, you know, Brilliant. a billion dollar budget, but you still had to figure out how to get the music made, how to get to the gig on time. There was a lot of parallels. There are a couple jobs that, I felt always expressed pretty much all of it of what I'd learned. Producing a record to me is a very sacred 
activity and it's one that has changed unfortunately in many ways i know that you know i work with a lot of songwriters and artists and the idea of we need a producer is often just the guy sitting at you know pro tools who's kind of producing and he's you know maybe contributing artistically or something but you know he's the producer and there's a top liner and there might be somebody else i also love the idea of the producer as in the most beautiful expression of it george martin he wasn't in the beatles but he made the records he helped record them he helped get the right take he helped edit he suggested maybe a penny a trumpet on penny lane that was a piccolo trumpet and maybe there's a sitar and right you know the producer who produces i really love that so that was always fun for me because i got to be musical and I got to be in charge. I always liked being in charge. So, um, right. you know, so, so that was one of the things that expressed a pinnacle. When you said, though, about highs and lows, I'm so accustomed to the lows that if there's a high, I almost don't believe it. And people don't ever see that. If you take a thousand swings, you might hit four balls and you have 996 that are strikeouts. That's, you just, people don't understand. Right. It, it's just the more you swing, the more you strike out too. So I swing a lot, and I love to swing, of course. So um, right. you know, you're a jazz you musician. Know, that's why. I'm a jazz musician. So swing we must. You know, it don't mean a thing right. if it ain't got that swing. But the <laughs> other part about it is sometimes the funny part is you get on top of a mountain and the top of the mountain isn't ex as exciting as the conversation you had climbing up the mountain with a friend. It's a really funny thing. You learn wow. something on the trip up the mountain that was like life changing. You get to the mountain, you go, hmm, it's okay. You ready to go down? Yeah, let's go. I don't, you know, I don't know why, but sometimes your expectation of what it'll be like to have a big hit movie. Well, that was cool for like two days and then you're back at work. I mean, I was nominated for an Oscar. I went to the Oscars on a Saturday night. I heard my name read out. I didn't win. Beauty and the Beast right. won. But I was out of work Monday morning. Nobody ever knows that. Monday morning, I was an Oscar-nominated songwriter who didn't have a gig. And I thought, what's wrong with this picture? Well, I don't know. I had a great weekend, that's for sure. But I'm back to looking for work. So right. it doesn't last. I wish I could tell you the fantasies that it's going to all, something's going to solve it. Tell me when something solves it. You got to be solved inside. You got to be happy inside and all the other shit. Just, you know, that's sprinkles on top of the cake. It's time, Robert. Thank you so much. I'm taking uh, up your time. No, no, not at all. That this, this last part, I mean, uh, was, was brilliant because there's, there's some life wisdom that, that you have where, we realize that you know the, the musical questions are great and the technical questions and the business the business questions but i think this is really where, where the value really lies in with people as yourself who've had this incredible trajectory and story to tell um you know we learn so much just about life as well as you know the music and filmmaking process as well so thank you so much robert well thank you i mean to that end how lucky am I to have somebody want to actually have a conversation like this with me? I mean, well, you know, that's, oh, are you very, kidding? We're that's there's very, about three, 400 of us across the country who are either, if not tuned in now are going to be listening after. I'm We're very lucky for this. grateful to have the opportunity to have the conversation. So it's equal.